Thank you, and, and thank you very much for that warm welcome, and thank you very much to the organisers for welcoming me here today. Talk a little bit about what we do uh, in our laboratories uh, within Nottingham. Uh, I think, uh, like David, I've had a very fortunate career, uh, and I moved to Nottingham uh, about 15 years ago, not knowing that I was working with some of the most eminent pathologists in the world, uh, particularly around breast cancer. But um, <clears throat> some of the story around that is that uh, um, over the years, we've had a, a real big international reputation uh, in lots of areas of breast cancer research, um, particularly in the pathological uh, areas. We've had lots of significant contributions uh, in breast cancer diagnosis, prognosis, so uh, how uh, long a person will survive uh, based on their cancer, uh, prediction, uh, and also in treatments. Now, when I was in nappies, um, my colleagues, uh, Roger Blamey, who was a surgeon, uh, and Chris Elston, who was a pathologist, got together and started looking at ways of prognosing breast cancer at that moment in time. There's very little information being able to give women information around uh, their likelihood of survival being diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, my colleague Ian Ellis uh, is, uh, later came in and started developing methods that we can use uh, very simply uh, in uh, helping uh, those women in the clinics. From that, um, <clears throat> there were two things that have came out of Nottingham uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s. The first is Nottingham grading system. And this is a standardized test uh, of looking down the microscope at the cells of breast cancer and looking at the patterns. And there's three different ways of looking at this um, in terms of uh, what we call tubule formation. Now, normal breast cells are trying to form tubules. Uh, they, they grow uh, to form tubes from the milk producing cells right down through to the nipple. And <clears throat> breast cancer cells can either, oops, sorry, ad adopt a very tube-like appearance. So you can see here, these breast cancer cells are uh, pretty much showing some sort of formation of tubes. In other cells, uh, you can see that this breast cancer hasn't got any tubes whatsoever. It, it's very different to a normal uh, population of uh, cells. And these are much more aggressive uh, tumors compared with these uh, that are trying to be much more like normal cells. We can also look at um, rates of nuclear pleomorphism, and that's really looking at how uh, large those tumor cells are compared with normal cells. I haven't got a, a slide to demonstrate that, uh, but you can see here this, this case of breast cancer has very large cells compared with this, this case. Uh, and you can also see um, that each cell is very different in size. So it's calculating the differences in size uh, compared uh, with each other. The other one is mitotic activity, which is how fast that tumor is growing. So the pathologists sit there and count all the cells that are actually actively divide uh, in in a certain number of fields. Again, I don't have a, an example of that today, but all of those three things are put together to form uh, what is known as the Nottingham grading system. Now, why is that important? Well, that can tell us how aggressive a cancer uh, is or isn't. And those that have a grade three are much more aggressive, probably need much more aggressive treatment strategies compared with grade one tumors that have a better uh, prognosis. So uh, the Nottingham grading system was then developed into um, a further uh, index, which is the Nottingham prognostic index. And this was again developed in the 90s, 80s. And it uses um, the Nottingham grading system, tumor grade, but it also uses two other components, the size of the tumor and also the lymph node status. So uh, if there are tumor cells within the auxiliary lymph nodes, and if so, how many of the lymph nodes actually uh, uh, got cancer in them? And using these three indicators, we can prognose very accurately uh, the uh, uh, survival of patients. But not only um, uh, enables us to do that, it's um, very easy uh, to uh, calculate. One of the things it doesn't do is tell us what treatments a patient should or shouldn't have. All it will tell us is uh, overall survival. And the three components are put in together a very simple 
uh, formulae, and then you can stratify patients into groups. Um, so this is a survival curve. Uh, for those not familiar with it, you've got time here at the bottom. This is in months. Uh, and then this is cumulative survival. So every time a patient uh, uh, dies, uh, this curve will actually drop down further and further and further. So you can see by using these three very simple uh, uh, morphological uh, um, and um, clinical aspects, we can put patients into groups that have what we call excellent prognostic group. And if you extrapolate that back over this period of time, over 80% of those patients will still uh, be alive uh, at the end of this graph. Flip that on the other side, those with the very aggressive tumors uh, in the poor prognostic group, um, you can see that um, there's 20% uh, people will be alive uh, over that time period. So it's very good at putting patients into to groups uh, to help clinicians uh, indicate what treatments uh, a patient should or shouldn't have. So those in the excellent prognostic group pretty much have a survival uh, compared with someone who hasn't got breast cancer. So you don't want to give those patients chemotherapy, for instance. They won't benefit. Uh, and obviously, with all the side effects from chemotherapy, um, there is no point in giving those patients those treatments. On the other hand, those with a very poor prognosis, uh, you would want to give as much treatment as possible uh, to hopefully uh, engage a response in those patients. So the Nottingham Prognostic Index um, really looks at two things. Um, one is how long that tumour has been there. So that's the size of a tumour uh, and also the stage, uh, uh, the lymph node staging. So it, that really tells us uh, a time-dependent factors. Whereas the grade, uh, looking at those components in, in, in the pictures earlier, uh, looks at the biology, very, very basic biology, because uh, it looks at the comparisons uh, within those cells. And of course, if you look at breast cancer down the microscope, um, they're all very different. Um, there are some, as we see, that, that uh, form tubules, some that don't. And if you look down at the microscope uh, at, at breast cancers, there's about 17 or 18 different mor morphological types. And each of those has a different uh, uh, a prognostic um, outcome in, in those patients. But it gets more complicated than that because over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, through molecular biology, through the human genome uh, uh, and sequencing, that David was talking about, we now understand a little bit more about the biology of breast cancer. And some very uh, eminent uh, papers uh, from about 10, 15 years ago can look at the expression of genes uh, within breast cancer. Uh, and they got the math mathematicians to look at these and look at the patterns of um, these gene expressions within in, in tumors. And they came up with several different subtypes based on biology alone. Now, these are broadly split uh, against those that show Eastern receptor and those that don't show Eastern receptor. So the Eastern receptor positive tumors uh, also uh, are known as luminal tumors. And then the Eastern receptor negative tumors uh, fall into uh, HER2 positive and also a basal-like subtype and also a normal breast-like subtype. So you can immediately think now that we've now got 17 or 18 morphological types, but then when we added the biology in, uh, it gets even more complicated. And what we've been trying to do in Nottingham is really move away from treating uh, patients uh, using this method of a very broad brush in biology to really uh, give uh, uh, an individualized treatment strategy. So moving away from the one size fits all to much more individualized based on the biology uh, of their own uh, cancer. And one of the tests that we've uh, been using very successfully over, over a number of years is immunohistochemistry. It's not using DNA sequencing, it's not high uh, molecular biology, but it's much more robust uh, in terms of the technology. And it allows us to look at the protein expression within uh, tissues, within cancers. And it's a very cheaper technology than uh, molecular biology is, and it's much more robust. And it's used in day-to-day -day, uh, diagnosis uh, in the clinic. For those that are unfamiliar with uh, immunistic chemistry, what we do is we take a very thin slice of tumor, and then we use some chemical reactions to look 
to see whether that, uh, that protein is expressed in the tumor. This is um, HER2 in, in breast tumor. And you can see that there's a variety of different stain in here. So these are um, cells where the brown coloration is, is where the protein is expressed. Uh, and those with HER2 positive breast cancer uh, would have something that looks like this. So these, each individual cell and the cell membrane uh, is actually overexpressed in HER2. Whereas on the other hand, you've got those cases here. This is a counter stain, so it just shows where the cells are. There's no HER2 expression within those. And there's some in between uh, at different levels. So immunohistochemistry allows us to look at lots of different proteins within breast cancer and other cancers uh, to really see how um, they uh, affect the patient outcome. And you've heard a lot about P53 uh, from David. And so something that we've done in Nottingham, um, and I've been incredibly fortunate to, to work in Nottingham because we have a very large series of archival breast tumors to use in our research. Um, the, 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 the biobank and the, the bank was set up many, many years ago. Uh, and we have uh, over 8,000, 9,000 breast cancer samples that we can utilize in our research to, to understand the natural progression of tumors based on protein expression. Uh, and so that's what our program has been doing for, for a number of years uh, and really looking at a lot of the translational uh, studies that we do, it's really identifying prognostic markers that will hopefully help to predict outcome for patients and eventually personalised treatment plans. One of the issues um, that we have is that patients kindly donate their tissue and there is only a finite amount of tissue uh, available to use. Um, the chemical test that we use, immunist chemistry, uh, is relatively cheap, but it's still um, $30, um, dollars, that's New Zealand dollars per slide. Uh, and it's also very labor intensive. You can do about 20 to 100 slides per day, uh, although now there's automation that you can probably ramp that up slightly. So um, back uh, 15 years ago, um, someone came up with an ingenious uh, solution uh, it, called tissue microarrays, and that's taken a very, very small core from each of these patients and being able to then put them into uh, um, uh, each together to make up an array of lots of different patients on one slide. So rather than using one slide per patient, uh, we could look at 150 to 200 slides uh, of patients per slide. Uh, so that dramatically um, decreases the cost and also the, the, the labor as well. Now, te technology's moved on uh, in 15 years, um, but this is essentially what we use currently to make these tissue microarrays. We've got an automated machine. And what we do is we have the tissue block here uh, with the fixed tissue uh, of breast cancer. Uh, and then we use um, a laser to identify the areas uh, what, that we want to sample. And they take a very small core, and that core is less than one millimeter in, in diameter. And that core is taken uh, by a small drill, and then it's put into a block uh, of wax. And then you can build up many, many different cores within that uh, over, over the whole block. Um, so this is what a, a tissue microarray looks like when it's stained, um, just to show where the, the, the cells are. And you can see that each one of these cores is a different patient and a different breast cancer. Um, it doesn't actually destroy the original block or, or the sample, you can see that this is uh, a tumor that we've taken several cores from, and you can still see uh, a lot that could be used uh, downstream. So what we've done for that is we, we've looked at uh, a, a total of 2,000 cases in Nottingham. Um, sorry, I've gone through uh, um, a little bit more. Um, to really understand some of the biology, and this was at the same time a lot of these molecular studies were coming out, but we wanted to see whether we could use immunohistochemistry as a very cheap alternative uh, to uh, uh, classify breast cancers in uh, using uh, their protein expression profiles. We had a very industrious PhD student at the time uh, who looked at over 25 different proteins uh, in 2,000 cases, uh, and, and we ended up with, with just over 1,000 cases that we could use uh, where we had expression of all of those 25 proteins. Um, now, one of the advantages of, uh, of this tissue array is that we knew uh, the clinical history of these patients, the characteristics of those tumours, and we also had long-term follow-up, so we knew exactly what those patients, uh, whether they had a recurrence of their disease, 
uh, whether they lived or, or died. So we used uh, a number of uh, different proteins, um, and, and this is uh, known as the hallmarks of cancer, um, which are the, the, the main mechanisms by uh, the way that cancer develops. Uh, it's a very complicated um, diagram, but basically what we did is we chose 25 different markers associated with cancers um, through some of the ones that are already used, such as Eastern Receptor and P53, uh, and, and some that are involved in invasion, metastasis, and some other markers as well. And we looked at all 25 markers. So someone assessed those, uh, and in terms of going back to uh, my previous slide, they would have uh, assessed how brown uh, the coloration for each of those cancers were for those 25 proteins. It took a very long time. But we had a lot of data, and um, a simple scientist like myself can't deal with that data very easily. Uh, so we um, um, got, got in touch with some computer scientists who started looking at the patterns of expression of those 25 proteins. And to cut a long, long, long story short, um, we managed to identify seven uh, breast cancer classes based on their protein. And we were very keen to try and see if we could utilize that as a, as a test uh, going forward in, in the clinic. And of course, measuring 25 proteins uh, can be a little bit unwieldy. Um, so we asked our computer scientists whether they could actually reduce the number of uh, sample uh, proteins that we could use within those to replicate using 25 biomarkers. And what we managed to do was reduce the um, biomarkers down to 10 key biomarkers that would actually group these uh, tumors into seven classes. And these are the markers here. Some are very well known. ER, we've got P53, we've got HER2, uh, but we've got some other key biological markers within that that groups those. Um, this is just a, a, an overview of some of the staining patterns of those. And we had uh, tumors, and it replicated what we saw within the molecular biological groups, that those are split against Eastern receptor positive and Eastern receptor negative and also HER2 positive. And these classes, uh, when we looked at the survival, um, were associated with different survival. So those of a luminal uh, um, subtype had a better survival than those that are ER negative and HER2 positive. And within the luminals uh, groups, we had three groups, and some of those groups had better survivals than the others. But what we were conscious of is that this was only looking at the biology. And uh, if you could think back to my slide when I was talking about the time-dependent factors, uh, we didn't want to lose that information. So we used the information that's in the Nottingham Prognostic Index, the time factors, and really looked at how they operated within each of those biological classes. And what we found was they were very different. Some biological classes um, required um, extra information around how fast those tumors were growing, and some uh, were based on, on the size and whether there was lymph node invasion. So we used computer ma mathematical modeling and um, found that we could um, use this information to really split those biological classes, uh, those seven classes, into subgroups uh, that had a good prognosis or a poor prognosis. And this is another survival curve. This is the first uh, class of tumors. This is an ER-positive tumor class called luminal A. And what we were able to do by in, uh, completing that information on both the bio biology and the time-dependent factors is that we could split them into, into groups. Um, so we've got one that has a very good prognostic uh, performance and one with a very poor prognostic performance. And we could replicate that through each of the classes of breast cancer. Um, so there's two groups or sometimes three groups, one of a very good prognostic group and one a very poor prognostic group. We also then looked at how um, we could predict whether there was a survival advantage in those that had receiving uh, systemic therapy, so whether that was hormone therapy or chemotherapy. And again, we could still predict uh, those that had a poor or better outcome. We also could put these into groups uh, on risk of distant metastasis, and so whether these tumors would actually uh, develop uh, metastasis over time. And again, we could split these into groups, um, those with a very low risk of metastasis and those with a very high risk of metastasis. And that's right across uh, the biological classes. Um, 
this really just demonstrates the differences between our traditional MPI and the MPI Plus. And in, in terms of time, um, the, the main thing is that we're able to apply this test to all forms of breast cancer, the primary and very pervasive breast cancer. There are certain tests, molecular tests, that are available, such as Oncotype DX, which is purely for uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but our test uh, applies right across those molecular subtypes. And what we're doing now is we're very much working on improving this test to see whether we can then get it, this into the clinic. We're looking at how we can use it in the progression uh, of a patient's journey of being when diagnosed uh, and getting it into clinical practice. So that's what we're currently working on now. Uh, of course, there's lots of acknowledgements. This study has been going on for a, a very long time in one form or another. another. Um, I haven't put names of people on here. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that are involved in, in this project uh, over the years. But I think the most important those are those patients that have been able to donate tissues to us to enable this work to complete. Um, so I pay tribute to all of those women that have donated their tissues um, that we can get this information uh, from our research. Uh, I will leave it there. We had lots of media coverage uh, over the years around our tests, and we certainly hope to uh, get this uh, moving forward uh, into the clinics uh, as soon as we can develop the tests even further. I will leave you with our current team. Uh, again, uh, I work in a, a large team of scientists, clinicians. Uh, this is our pathology team, and, and again, without all of those, uh, I wouldn't be here presenting today. So thank you very much for your attention.